Hello, Manchester, Salford, Media City, The Lowry, DDC. This is so showbiz. This is kind of weird, isn't it? I've always wanted to do something like that, so there you go. I've, I've done it. Um, <clears throat> so today's talk is going to be called Mirror Signal Manoeuvre, How Understanding Context Indicators and Strategic Direction Can Make an Impact, Not a Car Crash. Um, as Jeff said, if you want to tweet, tweet me uh, questions, I'll, I'll hopefully we'll pick those up. Twitter account is at Simon Tanner. Um, this presentation is also already available on SlideShare. Um, there should be a tweet out there that someone can repeat so that you don't have to take masses of notes because I do have a tendency to do quite dense and informative slideshows which uh, you probably can't take all the notes down as you go. So don't worry, it is all out there uh, for you to, to, to access later. So what do I mean by mirror signal maneuver? Well, mirror for me is about understanding context, it's about looking at the world around us and understanding our place in that world and understanding how we fit and what we want to do fits into that. Signal is about choosing your indicators, about deciding what are the things you want to measure, uh, what are the things you want to take notice of, the questions you want to ask to enable you to understand how your context fits into that wider context better. And manoeuvre is about deciding strategic directions, and for me, strategic directions should always come from a place of your values, and so we'll talk a little bit about that. Now, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to say to you today comes from the work that I've done uh, looking at measuring impact for digital resources, and particularly my balanced value impact model. Now, one of the things I want to say to you today is, is that this is a big overarching impact model. It provides a framework for thinking about impact, but it also it can feel a little bit big um, if you're coming at it and you haven't done any of this before. So my advice to you today is take what you need from today's presentation, take what you need from the model. You don't have to implement it all the way through. It's a little bit like thinking about PRINCE2 as the project management thing. You know, If you've done PRINCE2 training, you'll see it's like this massive thing, which is great if you're going to build the channel tunnel. Um, so if you're a big organization like The Welcome who've impl implemented the Balanced Value Impact model, it works for you great. If you're a smaller institution, you can do PRINCE light. You can do uh, BVIM light. So um, please uh, think about the bits that you can take from this that, that will work for you. Um, so I'm going to show you everything, but that doesn't mean you have to use everything. Uh, so one of the things that I wanted to do was talk to you about, uh, just briefly about my department, Digital Humanities. But before I sort of talk a little bit about my department of Digital Humanities at King's College London, there's always that thing of, well, what is digital humanities? And strangely enough, one of our PhD students, Adam Crimble, who's now uh, an academic um, uh, in, in his own right, uh, out there doing uh, wonderful things. Uh, I think it's at Leeds, actually. I'm just suddenly, is it York? No, my brain's gone dead. I think he's at York now. Um, uh, did a short presentation about his PhD, and in many ways this is a really good example of how digital humanities works with libraries and libraries collections. So I'd just like to show you this uh, brief video just to give you an insight into what I mean when I say digital humanities. And this is available on YouTube to watch, so you can get it for yourself later. Can you describe your thesis in two minutes? Most people think historians spend all their time in the library reading books, and you wouldn't be far off. But recently, the library has gotten too big way too big, and it's getting bigger at an alarming rate. That's because billions of records have been digitized and are now online. Historians are faced with far more material than they could ever hope to read in a lifetime, or even a hundred lifetimes. My research looks at a pretty typical historical question. How were Irish immigrants to London, England treated at the dawn of the Industrial Revolution? But instead of heading to the library, I'm heading to my computer to apply some of the best tricks of computer science to the task, namely distant reading. Distant reading basically means figuring out what something says without actually reading it. It's the type of classifying that Google does to help you find a recipe for an apple pie. Google hasn't read those web pages. Instead, they've created a computer program that does it for them. I'm doing the same thing, but instead of focusing on pies, I'm asking questions like, which documents refer to Irish people? Like Google, I've developed a set of computerized tests to determine if a document is relevant or if it's not. That automation is crucial when you're dealing with databases containing hundreds of millions of words of text. But finding relevant material isn't all we can do in the age of the internet. Computers have also allowed me to measure aspects of 19th century life in which the Irish experience differed from that of a typical Londoner. For example, I can tell you that an Irish person was roughly four times more likely than an English counterpart to appear in a London court on trial for his or her life. 
There's no way we would ever have found that out without distant reading. We live in a world in which information is overabundant, and managing it effectively can mean the difference between finding what you're after and getting lost in a jungle of data. There's too much to read out there, so it's time we found another way to do it. My name is Adam Crimble. I'm a student at King's College London in the United Kingdom, and the title of my thesis is Understanding the London Irish Immigrant Experience Through Large-Scale Textual Analysis, 1801-1820. to So give, give Adam a shout. Uh, he's a real uh, mover and shaker in this world. And uh, for me, you know, what we're talking about there is, is, is the essence of digital humanities, which is about uh, thinking about innovative uh, technological ways in which we can answer research questions that may previously have been uh, difficult for us to contemplate, whether that's because of the feasibility of contemplating those, those, those questions or uh, to do with the ability to... Uh, use technologies to come at the research in a way that we may not have been able to do previously. And uh, I wrote in response to the research um, evaluation framework, uh, sorry, the research excellence framework, the REF, uh, a post about why that was good for digital humanities. And I do mean digital humanities, I don't just mean digital humanities at King's, I mean digital humanities everywhere. Uh, in the UK, and that's because we saw through the results of the, of the REF that um, there were a number of things. Digital humanities res research resources were recognised. One of the things that's quite uh, indicative from the REF was if you look at the Arts and Humanities uh, panel overall, Panel D, as it, was, as it was called, there are more digital resources um, delivered in the REF in Arts and Humanities than all of the other panels put together. So Arts and Humanities has been really innovative in the use of digital as part of its research activities, whether that's in the digital humanities or in other subjects. So these resources are being recognised. We're showing that digital humanities enhances the research environment. Um, this was particularly true at King's um, in terms of the way that these things are scored uh, with one star, two star, three star, four star, four star being the highest mark that you could get. Uh, King's Digital Humanities Research Environment scored 100% four star. This is a research environment that is uh, enhancing those activities. We've actually also decided at King's that we're going to externalise our developers so you don't have to go through the Department of Digital Humanities. We're making that a faculty-wide activity called King's Digital Labs. And that's going to be a very exciting opportunity because it will mean that all of our academics, they don't have to come and partner with the Digital Humanities academic to get access to the technologies. They can just go straight there and get access to our, our Digital Humanities research teams and developers directly. So lots of exciting stuff going on there. So we think it enhances the research env environment. And digital humanities has impact. And I will be talking more about the impact agenda and what REF means by impact uh, as, as we go through this, this talk. Um, but one of the things that's probably worth saying is that on that four-star, three-star measure, um, uh, our, our departments partnered with um, Creative Media and Cultural Industries scored 90% at four-star for, um, for impact. Uh, which is a lot um, in the scheme of things. Uh, let me put that into context. No other department in King's um, scored more than 70% for uh, research impact at four star. So that gives you an indication that that was somewhat exceptional for us. So moving into the mirror signal um, maneuver. So Mirror is about understanding your context. It's about looking in the mirror and seeing more than just yourself. It's seeing around you. It's, it's having that sort of 360 degree view. And it's about understanding, particularly for digital, your digital ecosystem. Uh, you know, this is a defined resource. It's about a cohesive set of primary and secondary materials. It's going to be accessed through digital platforms primarily. You're um, going to have digital content. There's going to be a definable group of users that you're intending to reach with that. Obviously, there'll be other people who come along as well. It doesn't have to stand alone. It could be part of a wider set of activities, products, or services, but it's part of a digital ecosystem. So if you imagine your world as a digital ecosystem, uh, as your resource, there's that interlocking set of contents, users, stakeholders who care that it's there, 
payment mechanisms or trading mechanisms, whether that's people's time or money or, or attention, legal frameworks, um, technology platforms and infrastructures, links to other digital resources. And it's important that you understand your ecosystem before you start deciding how you're going to change it or how you're going to move forward from where you are. Because how can you plan if you don't really understand how things work, where you are at this point in time, and how things set together? And one of the things I'll give you is a challenge later on to sort of think about, well, how does your institution act in this ecosystem uh, and uh, what does this tell you about how things are. So Mirror is about understanding your digital ecosystem. Part of that understanding is then thinking about the signal that you want to send out and that could be a, a adapted from uh, a set of indicators. And top of my list of things that I want to know once I've understood my ecosystem is have I been clear about my assumptions? because assumptions are a problem when you do not openly signal them. And many of us live in environments where we have what we might call an environment of accidental management or organic management, where decisions are made on the basis of uh, situations that we're, we're sat in. But actually, what's really happening is, is those decisions are based upon a whole set of assumptions that have got you to this point that no one's actually ever explicitly stated. And that can be problematic. So one of the things I would advise is be clear about your assumptions, be open about them, and understand them. So from my perspective, some examples of problematic assumptions. Uh, some of these may be even quite uh, uh, challenging for you here today. So digitization equals democratization. That's an assumption I hear constantly. If we extend access, that's the same as democratization. Really isn't. I'm going to come back to that later. Uh, or my digital environment equals my community's digital environment. Well, that's not also uh, particularly true. And you need to think about your digital ecosystem. So, for instance, when we've been building projects, I've done a lot of, I do a lot of work in Africa on capacity building projects uh, around, around, around Africa in terms of the digital ecosystem. If you're in South Africa, you have to build for mobile because most people access the web through a mobile phone or a tablet device. Very few people are sitting at home with wired access. We're talking about the, the, the mobile phone type of wireless. And so that's going to affect bandwidth. That's going to affect what you can, how they can access and what they can do. So we need to be aware that we're talking to our communities. We're understanding what their environment is. What are they good at? What are they wanting from us? There's the other assumption, digital is everything today. If we build it, they will come. No, they really won't. It doesn't work like that. Um, they, you know, if when, if when we say, if we build it, what we mean is us and our community build it together, yeah, then they'll come. If we just build it and say, we're in broadcast mode, here, everyone, have the largesse of our collections. That's a bit of a risky prospect. It may not be true that they will come. Planning, oh, it's so 20th century. Let's be agile. You know, let's just do agile development. Um, you know, I, I, in digital humanities, we do a lot of agile development, but we have a very clear idea why we're doing it. We have a plan. We have a, 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 an idea of how each iteration is going to build on the other one. You know, I know that planning is difficult. You know, it's a, it feels unnatural. It feels difficult, but, you know, uh, and... You know, it's, it's just better to get on with the job, isn't it? You know, because, you know, let's not plan, let's just get on with the job, and then failure can come as a surprise rather than being preceded by a period of worry and doubt. Um, so we need to be planning. And the last one, money is the primary trade worth having with our community. And particularly when we talk about open access, when we talk about open collections, open glam, um, we see that tra the trade that we have in those contexts is not about a money trade. It's not about, here's my image, you buy it from me. It's, here's my image, I'm trading attention. You're spending time with me, I'm spending time with you. We're doing something together and we're building something together that's bigger than the thing we can build on our own. So don't look at money as being the only thing that's worth having from your community in that sense. 
So when we get down to the more formal concept of what is an indicator, how do we signal our direction, test our assumptions, measuring what you can know, then we talk about it being a merely a piece of information that indicates something useful to you. And remembering that indicators are clues to answering questions. They're not absolute answers, because no indicator can cover everything you ever want to know. So, you know, I'm not going to say anything uh, unknown here. Make them smart. Your smart indicators are obviously a good thing to do. Try and focus indicators on measuring change rather than stasis. One of the things that often happens is that when we put indicators in place, we're just measuring things that we pretty much already know the answer to. Um, what we want to know is if we change something in the way that we offer our service, if we change something in the way that we've brought new collections online, how can we measure what changes in, in response to those, those activities? These are things that are interesting and particularly powerful indicators. And choose as few indicators as possible um, so that you're uh, not ending up being flooded with so much information that you don't know what to do with it. But remember not to overclaim. Uh, indicators can easily create a false impression or provide an incentive to do disruptive or counterproductive actions. So uh, be careful not to overclaim. And this is particularly a problem uh, with anyone who's in the area of evaluation or impact measurement or, or, or those activities. Um, so, so let me give you an example of, of an indicator and how you could be tempted into overclaiming. Uh, from that indicator. So let's say you're a, a very large library with a decent newspaper collection, and over but you're in a slightly remote location, and over many years, people have been accessing uh, your newspaper collection by coming to the, your library and looking at your newspapers on microfilm. And so uh, you get some funding, some money from somewhere, and you digitize your newspapers, and you make them available through a fantastic interface, and now, people from, their, from the comfort of their own home can access those newspapers. Schools and, lo and local groups are accessing those newspapers. How do you show that that's had a benefit on that community? Well, one of the ways that you can do is that you do actually have, in the case of this library that I'm thinking of, you actually have the, uh, the user figures uh, for the last 20 years of microfilm access to your newspaper collections. And those user figures actually come with information about those users, which tells you where they came from. So what you could do is you could put an in an economic indicator in there and work out an average cost per mile for people to come and access those newspapers over the last 20 years. And you could say, well, maybe 200,000 people have seen those newspapers over the last, the last 20 years. But actually, now they're digitally available. We can show that we're now having a magnifying effect. You know, 200,000 people are accessing them a month. And you know, this is a magnifying effect in terms of how many people are accessing them. But we can also show that their means of accessing those, those materials, if we wanted to reach 200,000 people a month, it would have cost us X amount of money in terms of the old way of accessing that material through those microfilms and traveling to their, those activities. Those are reasonable indicators that would show a change, that would show a benefit, that would show the range of activity that you've done. Overclaiming would be to say that you've made the country wealthier. So overclaiming would be saying, well, because people can access this from home, it, they must be, it must be better for them. They must be economically better off. And the country is going to be better off. Well, remember, all those 20 years when those people were traveling to the library, well, they were using resources to get there. They were stopping off in cafes and, and uh, supporting the local community. They were buying train tickets and, and petrol for their cars. They were part of the economic environment. So that would be an overclaim, wouldn't it? You know, to, to say that, oh, because we've done this, you know, give us a pound and we'll put three pounds back into the economy. It's a little bit of an overclaim in that context of that. So be careful about how your indicators, what they actually do show and what they can be useful for. So I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about a, a project that I'm involved with, as mentioned before, the Academic Book of the Future. And we're looking at the REF results as being... Uh, the REF 2014 results as being a data set that we can use for us as indicators of what academic publishing is like and what, uh, how academics uh, relate to uh, the things that they, they write. Now, what we think that we can get from this is that mirror effect that I was talking about. 
so we can sort of hold this up as a, as a, as a thing for academics to reflect on. I'm going to flick through these slides fairly quickly because the point here is not to give you a presentation on the academic book of the future, but to give you an idea about how this works in indicators. So what you can see here is across all of the different subject areas, you've got the different types of output types that were submitted to the ref. So the, the red bar at the bottom is, is authored books. The green is, is um, edited books. The small purple bar is scholarly editions. The larger blue bar is book chapters. And then we have uh, journal um, papers. And uh, you can see that journal papers are still quite dominating, but there's a heck of a lot of books out there. And if you look into sort of traditional subjects, such as modern languages and linguistics, English language and literature, you can see that, and history, you can see that books in one form or another are still taking up at least a quarter of the submissions that were made to the ref. And if you add in book chapters, um, we can see that there's still an awful lot of book chapters being submitted as well to those. Uh, and if we were to look into uh, other subject areas, and maybe if I go back for a second, you can see that there's also some quite big differences. You can immediately see where things are very similar, but you can also see where things are quite different. So if you're in uh, music, if you're uh, in art and design, then you're going to be submitting things such as composition. You're going to be su submitting things such as exhibitions. You know, those sorts of submissions are there. And the ref showed that they were equally marked. They were not marked up or down. Uh, 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 according to the output types. So we can learn stuff about this, about the things that are similar, the things that are different. We can investigate those. We can do some deep dives looking at, say, a particular subject area, such as English language and literature. 2,220 books in the following output types were submitted, authored, edited books, scholarly editions. 385 unique publishers found. This was very surprising to the academic community. They thought that it would be like 50. And look at this long tail. Yes, there are a certain amount of publishers who have a lot of books submitted. But actually, when you get to about here, almost well over half of the publishers are submitting five or fewer books or only one book having been submitted in that subject area. And we can see how many publishers are from university presses. We can see there are 23 publishers with more than 10 books submitted. They're all listed here from Palgrave, Oxford, Cambridge, Edinburgh, University Press. Now, these are useful indicators. They tell us something. They challenge us to think about what we're doing. This is the, this is the sort of data that is useful to us to do. Now, it's great because someone else went and gathered all that data for me. All I've got to do is spend an enormous amount of time making that data meaningful. Because one of the problems that we have is that academics are rubbish at doing bibliographies, even of their own books. You'd think that if it's your own book, you'd know what the ISBN is of your own book, wouldn't you? You think you'd know what the publisher is of your own book. Well, actually, no, there's problems. There's also problems, obviously, with the data, because do you know there are probably about 20 different ways an academic can come up with um, uh, of saying Oxford University Press? I would have thought there were only really about three, but apparently there are 20. So, you know, there's a lot of work that goes into this, this data. So once you've got your indicators, you can use those to tell you things about your context and about the change that you're making in your communities so that can help you to think about maneuvering, about your strategic direction and planning for impact. And so uh, the uh, balanced by impact model just bases on this sort of basic logic model, which is that we have a set of resources and inputs that will lead to activities. Those activities will generate outputs. And generally, one of the problems with digitization projects is we often stop at the output stage and go, look, we did 100,000 things. Isn't that great? No, no, no. We have to go on and measure outcomes. You know, um, you know, how did our participants benefit in certain ways? And can we go that extra step from there and say how we show impacts? Uh, have those benefits created a change or made a difference to people in their environment? So coming to the balanced value impact model. So I have a very, uh, a fairly uh, um, purist view of what impact is, because remember, I'm seeing it at the very end of that chain. It's fine to stop at outcomes. Uh, it's not so good stopping at outputs. But it's great, to, you know, it's fine to stop at out outcomes. But for me, impact is about the measurable outcomes arising from the existence of a digital resource that demonstrates a change in the life or life opportunities of the community. So it's a fairly purist view. If you look at what the REF says, the REF says impact is any effect on change or benefit to the economy, society, culture, public policy or services, health, the environment or quality of life beyond academia. So that's a much more uh, all-encompassing 
view of what, what impact is in, that, in that, that context. And one of the things that's difficult, obviously, about assessing impact is that you're in the game of cause and effect. You're trying to show that what you did had, you know, was the cause of the effects that you have measured. And sometimes that can be tricky because sometimes your digital ecosystem is so complicated, it's difficult to know whether it's what you did that made the difference or the environment in which you're in that made the difference or just something simple like it, what you're actually measuring is your marketing activity and how well you marketed the resource, not necessarily how much of an impact or a change that made to that community. And so uh, I admit freely that impact is, is tricky. But one of the things that we need to be able to do is to ask questions early and ask them in a sort of continual fashion rather than thinking, OK, this is something we're going to do in the last three months of our two-year project and then we're done. Um, we need to be thinking about it over a longer period of time and giving ourselves the room to ask um, questions. And some of those can be sort of passive indicators. They don't have to be a very active, constantly going out surveying and focus grouping people. It could be, for instance, one of the things that we looked at for the welcome with their code breakers was how many times is code breakers cited in PhD dissertations? Now, that's an indicator that's going to take several years before you would see the results for that. But it's also a passive thing. They don't really need to do very much to get that data, because that data is just going to flow. You can just set up a search that will just pull that from the citation information. Um, and so it's a very cheap thing to do to extend over a long period of time. So think about um, setting up your, in, your indicators and your signals early to show that um, you can your impact as you go along. So when I talk about impacts, um, we did uh, work with Hefke on assessing uh, the, uh, uh, the impact that was stated in, in, the, in the REF impact case studies. And there were over 60 areas of, of impact that were found in that environment. I'd like to simplify that down. There's only really 10 for me in this sense. Um, and they're about education and learning, engaging, increasing knowledge, health and well-being, so social and community cohesion, entertainment and participation. It's fine to be entertaining. Uh, environmental and sustaining, economic and generating wealth, making your community richer, that's always okay. Uh, political and democratizing, uh, technology and innovation, equality and inequity. And, but remember that the essence of in, in, impact is that it can be internal or external. It doesn't have to be something that changes the world. It could be something that just changes your organization. Um, it can be positive or negative. If you're honestly doing this properly, you will accept that it could be that you've had a negative impact. And that, that then goes into your decision as to how you're going to maneuver uh, in the future. And it can be intended or not. It may be that you've set out to do one thing, like we did with the fine rolls of Henry III, where we went out to set up uh, with the National Archives an incredibly uh, uh, you know, integrated um, academic resource on the fine rolls of uh, Henry III but we find that that's being used about five million times a year. So that's a lot of public use that's happening to those resources, which we never really set out to do. You know, we're academics. We're quite happy if like 300 people are looking at something because they're going to be looking at it in great depth. It's going to be very meaningful to them. But here we are with a resource that's suddenly being used by a lot more people than we thought it would be. <coughs> Excuse me. So what would success look like? So let's say you've done the magic of the balanced value impact model. Obviously, it's going to be a doddle, isn't it? It's going to be so easy to do this. It's not going to take any time or effort. Um, that's maybe over me overstating there for a moment. But <coughs> success for me would be to be able to make the statement that says, we are more effective and efficient in delivering change and tangible benefits. We have become, we've had an internal impact. Our organization is gaining strategic advantage through innovation inherent in this digital activity. We've gained an innovation impact, the sort of innovation impact that you saw with the welcome when they're talking about the cloud service, you know, that sort of innovation impact. Uh, we are delivering a strong economic benefit to our community that demonstrate the worth and value of our endeavors in clear monetary terms. Are we having an economic impact? Are we making our community feel more wealthy in some, some respect? And that the community has been changed by the resource in beneficial ways that can be clearly identified. Are we having a social impact? And so for me, it's that balance of internal and external impacts that we're looking for. 
So that's the sort of, it's all wonderful, do all these things and everything will be fine. Let me talk about avoiding the car crash, some thoughts on this. Um, and uh, some of this uh, I, I've added in since yesterday because I was inspired by some of the things that we said yesterday in, in this aspect. So uh, standards. Are you happy, Polly? I mentioned standards. Good. Um, someone said to me yesterday, no one's talking about standards. They really should. They're very important to the success of these activities. Yeah, they really are. Choosing the right standards. This is one of the problems, obviously, is there's so many out there that you can choose. But at the same time, um, you know, generating, uh, generating activities through the use of standards means that you get the benefits of things like the IIIF uh, type benefit of having, you know, images that just zoom without having to have lots and lots of technology, proprietary technology around the outside. So think about standards and invest in standards. Consider the attention economy. And it's very important to think about this in terms of impact because we're in a situation where we're not actually in a knowledge or information economy because that would suggest that um, information is scarce. Uh, information's not scarce. Good information, trustworthy, authenticated um, uh, you know, information is scarce, and that's what everyone in this room has. What we're actually competing for, though, is attention, the ability to attend to, to take time to spend with your resources. And so we need to think about that as being maybe one of the main indicators of success for us, is how much time our communities spend with us, rather than how many people are in our community, because you are not going to be able to compete on the numbers. Let me give you an example. The totality of analog photography is roughly about three trillion photographs. So all of the photography that's ever been taken in the world uh, roughly is about three trillion, three trillion photographs. There's about 500 million photographs in museum collections, museum and libraries and archives collections in Europe. So 500 million out of three trillion photographs that were ever taken. Now, obviously, um, a lot of those photographs are of, are of babies. I think Kodak in the 1960s said that about 50% of their film stock was used for taking pictures of family members. You know, and, and, and I do mean babies there, not the other men. Um, but we're not going to be able to compete. You know, if we've got 500 million photographs in all of the museums, there's approximately about 250 billion photographs have been uploaded to Facebook. Roughly 350 million photos are uploaded every day. So here's the economics of this, the economics of that digitization. You are not going to be able to impress any government minister by saying, I've got a million photographs online. Because 350 million photographs on Facebook every day. That's the situation you're competing with. You can't compete on the numbers. You have to compete on the value on the benefit, on the fact that your photographs are worth looking at, that your photograph collections have um, a intrinsic impact beyond uh, your collections. So let's take this cost of digitizing Europe's cultural heritage report. So European museums, about 500 million, library collections, archives, etc. Approximately 90% of the photographic record is recorded as orphaned, so that's a huge problem there in its own right. But they did an estimate here that based on 30% of the total, if we did about 8 million photographs, we'd need somewhere in the region of 14 to 19 million euros to do that. That's a shed load of money to digitize 8 million photographs, remembering that we're still not even touching you know, the 350 million photographs that are uploaded to Facebook every day. So the economics are against us. So we need to find other values. We need to be able to generate and push our values uh, when we're talking about the impact of our collections. Don't try and play the numbers game. It really won't work for you, especially if you're a small organization. But what will work for you is the engagement, the relationship you have with your communities. These are the things that are going to matter. And that's why I'm going to talk about democratization and contested spaces. Because as I say, I do a lot of work in countries like South Africa, Rwanda, Sudan, and, uh, and Ghana, and um, uh, with colleagues from, from, from King's and, and, and other activities. And what becomes really clear when you're working in those environments where you're working with maybe young countries which are looking for national identity, looking for opportunities to say, this is who we are, is you realize that, as uh, Michelle Pickover said from South Africa, cyberspace is not an uncontested domain. The digital medium contains an ideological base. It's a site of struggle. Those national identity issues, those 
issues of personal identity become more clear. And when we talk about democratization, meaning just make it accessible, well, what is it you're making accessible? Because, you know, when we take part in appraisal, selection, arrangement and retention of material, we cannot help but privilege certain narratives and silence or marginalize others. So when we talk about democratization, how do we genuinely offer democratization in the digital domain when people are struggling to just be? to belong, to build an identity, to be recognized, to be believed, to be understood, to understand, and to be heard. That's what democratization means to me, not just we've made stuff available. And I also want to have a little rant about crowdsourcing. <coughs> Sorry about this. <laughs> I will finish on this rant. OK, I was involved in a project with the Shetland Dars Museum uh, around the millennium, so 15 odd years ago. I'm getting old. I've, I've got history stories now. Um, and we digitized um, on site 80,000 glass plate um, photographs there. And we built a lot of capacity in that community. And the crofting community did a lot of adding of metadata to that collection and, and understanding you know, family members, the names of boats, the names of this, that aspect. There were a lot of pictures of puffins, but there were lots of pictures of other things as well. And what we had was they were accessing that. And in a sense, it was very much like an early concept of what crowdsourcing is. But actually, it, it felt much more like volunteering. And I'd like crowdsourcing to go back to the concept of volunteering, where volunteers get a very high level of explicit skill levels, where we have a lot of high community engagement, where the task is achieved, but its success was defined by the community, not just by the museum. Because this is my problem with crowdsourcing. If you look back at the essence of crowdsourcing, and where it comes from, it comes from a very sort of neoliberal, getting work done for free type concept. And in a sense, if you have it just being task orientated, utility orientated, then basically the benefits to the crowd are kind of very tacit, not very tangible. It's about entertainment, it's about passing the time, it's about being part of maybe a bigger thing, a community, all those useful things. But actually, we're building quite low levels of skills in those communities. For the most part, there are lots of really good projects out there. We saw some of them yesterday, um, which are doing good work. But if we become orientated that it's about completing the task, then actually, who benefits in this value chain? It's really the host organization is the key beneficiary. You've had your collection catalog. Well, that's great for you. Um, but the benefits to the bigger community are somewhat marginal. High volumes reached by those benefits, but they're very, quite small. So I'm trying to say, challenge, can we find our telecrofters? You know, it, I want to ask some challenging questions. If crowdsourcing is so great, why are there so few projects? Um, you may think there's lots and lots of crowdsourcing projects. I go to a number of, of conferences. It's the same crowdsourcing projects over and over again. They're not being done in the thousands. They're being done in the tens. I've had students who've been trying to do dissertations where they've been looking at crowdsourcing, and they've gone out to museums in London and around the country and said, oh, you've done a crowdsourcing project. Can we talk to you about it? And they go, yeah, well, we've done one. We're never doing another one, and we don't have the staff who did that one. So, you know, crowdsourcing, if it's so great, why are there so few? Um, volunteers, you know, the old-fashioned definition of an amateur, which is doing something because you love it. That's the real definition of an amateur or of a volunteer. They have much higher engagement, develop a much higher skill base. We see the change in their lives, and we can then measure in some way that change and show that back. So personalize the crowd. Reach out to individuals, build genuine relationships and listen. The task is not everything, look beyond mere utility. And as I say in my blog post, crowdsourcing is dead, long live citizen humanities. So one final word and, um, and that, uh, that, that quiz that we're going to do. So one of the things that I would say is very useful to you if you're thinking about that mirror signal maneuver is consider your organization, consider the digital resources and your digital ecosystems and ask yourself the question, is the value in the glass, the wine, or the drinking? What do I mean by that? Well, think about the wine as being your content, the glass as being your infrastructure, and the drinking as being access. Where do you put your focus? What matters most to you? Now, you can imagine if you're a national library or if you're the, the National Archives, then the quality of the wine matters a great amount. Your 
Library of Last Resort or, uh, you know, there uh, for, the, for the nation. And so the quality of the wine matters a lot. If you're Twitter, the quality of the wine really doesn't matter as long as lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of people are drinking. It's all about the drinking. Get everyone drunk as much as possible. <laughs> lots of drinking. Drink, 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 drink. OK. Now, but all of you in the room here, we're all invested in the glass, aren't we, as well? And it's kind of like the hidden hero in this activity, because without the glass, we haven't got anything to put the wine in. And we can't get it to people to enable them to drink it. It all slushes on the floor, which is a bit messy, not really good for us. So is the value in the wine, the glass, or the drinking? So my final word is, can we do a Twitter poll today? So your vote. Is the value in the wine, the glass, or the drinking? So vote on Twitter today with the hashtag. We're using hashtags so you can put comments on it, so you can just add anything you want and then just add the hashtag where your vote is. Obviously, if you put a, uh, a tweet out there with all three hashtags, you're kind of voting for nothing, <laughs> for stasis. Um, if you can't decide, it is almost impossible to decide. But think about that. You know, Where would you put the value in this situation? So if you think on Twitter the value is in wine and content, then DCDC. DC, 15 wine. If you think it's in glass infrastructure, DC, DC, 15 glass. If you think it's in access and drinking, then DC, DC, 15 drink. It's a good job I didn't do this last night, otherwise you get a very different result. Um, and we'll collate the results and pass that back to you this afternoon. So thank you very much for listening to me.